Hey, everybody. Welcome to this weekly webinar brought to you by the Wildcats. <laughs> there is a reason I'm wearing a Kansas State Wildcat t-shirt, but we will reveal that later on. And so if you want to guess in the chat, whoever comes closest will win a Starbucks gift card courtesy of Jack that I've, you know, volunteered him to give. <laughs> so, but he knows, and so does Adam, why I'm wearing the Kansas State Wildcat t-shirt today. And it does have something to do. It goes actually back to my design roots. That's, that's the only clue I'm going to give you. So uh, as everybody is jumping on, who knows what we're going to deal with today, but there are still lots of questions. And Mike, had a question on ERTC, so we're going to deal with that because anybody else dealing with ERTC um, and having questions about that, we will read that answer or read that question and answer it early on. But there are a lot of things going on like, hey, um, is the government going to monitor my transactions of $600 and above? That I've heard that a couple times this week. Um, and there's some chatter about that you know what's happening with north carolina ppp uh expenses that could be deducted what's happening with that um so jack and adam it's great to have both of you back um it, it really is i i miss both of you it's not your your stunt double did a really good job jack and so did matt anderson for you adam uh but it's always good to have the the uh the three stooges together. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that. I wasn't sure if I was going to get a uh, a, um, a notice like, "Hey, you're done, we're out." So I'm glad Derek did well. I did. I did he watch did the great. video. I watched the video and and I, I do appreciate his input and his perspective from an employment law um, area. Yeah, totally. So Jackson, since you're talking and you're not in uh, Washington D.C., did you have any updates before? Uh, I know Adam's got some stuff probably percolating in his brain sure i mean I, I can go through a couple of just you know the, the fact updates um so the, the latest from the white house is you know we've been talking about 3.5 trillion dollars the number and so then it gets ratcheted down to uh and there was a comment yesterday that president biden said or it was tuesday it said he'd get senators mansion and cinema to agree to a range of 1.75 to 1.9 trillion versus the 3.5 trillion so you know, it's, it's ratcheting down uh, the number a little bit. And then um, just so we can kind of keep score of, of the voting that's required, uh, Democrats need unanimous support in the Senate and near unanimous support in the House to get the reconciliation bill enacted. Um, and then you have obviously the two senators I just mentioned that are the holdouts. Um, as far as the pandemic or, or the the issues with respect, and we'll try to talk about inflation and things like that, but um, some interesting commentary that it's, you know, supply chain, but it, it is something that was coming anyway. And it's just the pandemic kind of speeded it up that we have issues with infrastructure. Of course, you might um, predict or suspect where that comment came from, which side of the aisle essentially. But, you know, when you look at things, it's like, okay, the things that are happening um, there are some other statistics. Well, just to mention the bill that passed in the Senate. Okay, let me take a step back. The you, know, you have these two bills that are moving forward, and there's some discussion as to the fact that there was a promise that they were going to be kept separate, but now in the in, in the the Democrats, House Democrats are trying to keep it together as the two different packages. And so you know, there's there's a lot more momentum getting through the infrastructure bill. As, a, as kind of the band-aid to deal with some of these issues, which would deal with the supply chain issues and help um, somewhat what's going on now, but it's really in anticipation to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So again, some statistics, and this came from just to be perfectly transparent, uh, yesterday on the Senate floor, uh, Senator Portman, from, he's a Republican from Ohio, uh, was discussing some of these things and he threw out some numbers. So I'm just going to share them with you. I have not independently validated them. So uh, GPI um, or CPI, consumer price index, rose by 5.4% on an annualized basis, which is the largest year to year inflationary increase in 13 years. 
Um, and then he mentioned that your pumpkins are going to cost more this year, potentially 15.7% more, um, or you need to buy a smaller pumpkin. Uh, at the pump, 42% increase this year. Heating bills, 25% higher. Wages are down almost 2%. Um, and so, uh, and, and then it goes into um, also the issue that the money that's been infused, and, he, and again, don't know if this is a valid statistic, but he says, because of the generous unemployment insurance supplements that paid 42% of Americans, American workers more to go on unemployment than go back to work. And when we've discussed that many, many weeks, many weeks ago about how you know, people need to be going back to work and they're not because they're disincentivized or incentivized, depending on your perspective, to, to not to actually uh, go back to the office, even remotely. So um, anyway, so again, supply chain, we can talk about those kind of things. Um, another interesting statistic, 60 or 70 ships in a holding pattern near the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. And then I heard a statistic on the radio earlier this week that if ships could be unloaded 12 minutes faster, we would not have a supply chain issue. So that's how tight the timing is and what the problem we have. Now, I don't know if that means 12 minutes per container. It probably does mean per container or whatever, whatever number they, it, you know, section or whatever it may be. I, didn't, I don't know what the actual, it's not 12 minutes per ship. Um, so uh, anyway, so some interesting statistics that play into everything that we talk about and are talking about um, here and, and elsewhere. Yeah, that's good. All right, Adam. Talk um, to us. Tirade begins. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I am wearing the Hawaiian shirt because at 1140, I'm leaving to go on fall break with the kids. Uh, the oh, fun. Anna and Tybee Allen. Um, so I'm excited about that. But uh, with respect to um, you know what's happening. So North Carolina PPP expense deductibility. It's all part of the budget proposal. Still hasn't passed. Top secret negotiations between the um, General Assembly and Cooper to get something that they can vote on, and, and Cooper will sign. You know, there was talk that it would be the end of October. That might stretch into November. But, you know, again, the ability to deduct PPP expenses, which would mean everybody would need to amend their North Carolina return, you know, seems like it's going to go forward. We just can't say when or what freaking year at this point <laughs> that will actually go forward. Um, so that's one item. Secondly, you know, with respect to what Jack was talking about um, and the, the different proposals that are on the table, you know, I think, you know, this gets really nuanced <laughs> but when they talk of you know hey it's a 3.5 trillion dollar bill and we're scaling back to two trillion there are really you know three major changes that happened as a result of that scale back that are impactful you know number one is you know no free community college for everybody <clears throat> so that got stripped out Number two is they fix the duration on a lot of the um, provisions that were, you know, quote unquote, entitlement programs like child tax credit and stuff like that from 10 years roll back to five years or even less in some cases. So it's still in effect, it's just less duration. So $3.5 trillion was over a 10 year time span. Part of how they got the $2 trillion answer is they just cut the time. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, you know, while there are still some environmental um, global warming provisions um, in the in the two trillion dollar number, some of those got scaled back as well. Um, so, you know, and I think, you know, and I think rightly so, you know, Manchin made a case that look, I mean, we're already trucking down that path anyway. Like Ford Motor Company is not all of a sudden going to say, oh my gosh, there's no tax credit available anymore. I'm going to stop the billions that I've spent retooling and designing electric vehicles <laughs> to go backwards. It's like, you know, I, that, that ship, in my opinion, has sailed. <laughs> tax credit or no tax credit. So, um, 
so that you know that there there you have it so um you know people think that well that surely will translate into corresponding decrease in taxes as part of this proposal and i would say to that oh nay nay <laughs> because remember what i just said the way they went from 3.5 trillion to 2 trillion was to cut the duration <laughs> so they still got to pay for it you know to the tune of 350 billion dollars a year it's just they're going to do it through for five years instead of 10 years you know for, for the lion's share of it so that's a long way of saying that when I've been looking at the commentary on what's really changing from the original, you know, proposals that were floated out there regarding, you know, capital gains rates increasing, um, implementing, you know, Medicare surtax on, you know, S corporations and partnership income. You know, these are all things that would hit our clients. Um, you know, changing the changing the changing the top tax rate, um, implementing another surtax on top of it on incomes above five million bucks. You know, all that kind of stuff. The estate tax, you know, limitation going down. You know, changes in how grantor trusts will act. You know, all that stuff that we've been talking about is like, hey, we need to get on top of this. You know, and, and get prepared. The only two things <laughs> that I have seen. Um, that are generally, um, I think, positive out of all this is that, you know, one, from everything that I've seen, the concept of eliminating the step up in basis when someone dies or otherwise imposing a tax at death, um, that that's not in anything currently that I've seen that's out there. So, it's looking like, hey, we're just going to lower the limit, you know, back down to six million dollars um, per individual um, from where it is now, at, you know, a little more than eleven. You know, that's number one. Number two is, you know, completely in flux. There's talk of bringing back the state and local income tax deductions, which you know a lot of people, you know, talk about how oh, well that's really just a benefit. You know, people, you know, up in northern areas where there's, you know, high tax rates, high property tax rates, like, look, I, I'll tell you this right now. When I moved from Michigan to North Carolina and I saw that my check went down and my property taxes went up. What? Yeah. <laughs> so you, you should know, have moved in, and, into and it, and it's, Ohio. And, it, and, you would have and, seen and, again, and again, it's, I, you know, look, I, you know, that libertarian the, the republican truffle shuffle <laughs> um you know democrats want democrats want to uh raise rates um and then give stuff away republicans you know want to lower rates but then they take stuff away so you know the 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 tax cut the governor mccrory implemented actually raised revenue because it eliminated a lot of items in the North Carolina tax code that our clients took advantage of, you know, namely, you know, decoupled depreciation expense, bonus depreciation, you know, the exemption amounts. I mean, that's why we all had to fill out forms saying, hey, whatever you had filled out as your exemptions, you probably had to take the zero because you're going to own North Carolina taxes where you might not have owned them in the past. So it, it's just a long way of saying that, look, I mean, there is a lot of ballyhoo about, hey, that's only going to benefit, you know, Northeast or California, you know, people. It's like, look, I'll tell you what, I mean, you know, I had a big North Carolina tax liability that, that, that out, you know, that, that plus my mortgage interest, you know, outpaced my, per, my personal um, itemized deduction. And I sure would have liked to be able to use my North Carolina um, taxes that I paid um, as a tax deduction. <laughs> you know, versus not being able to use it as a tax deduction. So, you know, it, it does, it does benefit, you know, everybody that when I said, when I said it benefits everybody, you know, I, I'm, I was originally, you know, I lived for a long time in Blackwell, Oklahoma, where you can still buy a house for $45,000. Um, probably would not benefit me if I lived there because I just don't have a lot in the way of property taxes. <laughs> 
um, or income taxes. And, you know, the, the town is, you know, ghost town and kind of reflects that, you know, frankly. So um, sorry if anybody from Blackwell, Oklahoma is listening to this, probably not, but but here in, in Charlotte, I mean, you know, where medium house prices, I think, are, you know, bucking $300,000, $350,000, absolutely, this would be a benefit. So um, just something to think about. Those are kind of two big changes that we've seen. And then, you know, lastly, and again, those are those are generally positive and favorable items. Then lastly, you know, we, we did have a question around, hey, what's going on with the employer retention tax credit? Because in infrastructure bill number one, which is the, you know, hard infrastructure, they call it hard, I love it, I, I like to call it legitimate infrastructure, <laughs> you know, like stuff that we really think about when it comes to infrastructure. Roads and bridges. Yeah, roads, bridges, telecommunications, um, you know, not human infrastructure. Um, you know, part of that had a um, an elimination of the employer retention tax credit one quarter early, which was the fourth quarter. We're already in the fourth quarter, nothing's passed. So. The BGW position that I think is in concurrence with a lot of other people out there is that um, you know you still apply for the for, for the employee retention tax credit in the fourth quarter. It's the law of the land. You know you go with the law that's in place at the time and you run with it. And the tax court typically always is on your side on that. So keep trucking with the employee retention tax credit until informed. You know otherwise. Well, Mike will be very happy that you addressed that. So, Mike, go for it. <laughs> All right. So, for anybody that came on here late, a um, couple important announcements. Adam is going on a fall break with his wife and kids, and he's leaving in about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, secondly, if <laughs> anybody wants to guess why I'm wearing the Kansas State Wildcat t-shirt today, it does happen, have something to do. A clue is that uh, my design background in my early career kind of makes a statement about that. But Jack is going to be offering a Shoemaker Starbucks card uh, for anybody that gets it right. And if nobody gets it right, we'll just roll it in the next next week because we found out that jack also has kansas ties into mcpherson Can kansas which they were part of our um rivals actually they were the mcpherson bulldogs or bullpups <laughs> so uh oh okay good yeah yeah well so what i put in the what i put in the chat for everybody that's sort of that, that's wonky out there is that you know, really what, you know, what we should be focusing on is, you know, how do you, you know, how do we actually get people to pay, pay their fair share? So a lot of the tax legislation is also focused in having a minimum tax that, you know, large corporations just have to pay. So if you, you know, if, if you want to see who doesn't actually pay taxes, <laughs> Um, that is a large corporation that you would have heard of. I mean, I, you know, we've got videos on how that can actually occur, but yeah, this is sort of your dirty 55 list. <laughs> like, wait a second, I paid more in taxes than Duke Energy. I don't understand how that's even possible, but that is a true statement. <laughs> so anywho, sorry, Gary. No, not a problem. <laughs> but we do thank Duke Energy for these, uh, for this electricity, for this, lighting all of that so thank you duke don't cut us off just because we blew your cover right. <laughs> uh all right any questions out there please hit us up a lot of silence in that crowd today and i and i think the reason why is i didn't notice robert mayette on there i didn't see joe gas on there i didn't see papa joe <laughs> We can always count on the Joes and Robert. I also didn't see David Worrell on there. So, you know, I don't know what's going on with those guys. I do, I do have a comment from last week, though. I did watch the video to the end, and I, I appreciate that, you know, Derek kept the bar pretty high and, and did really well. I also appreciate that he lowered the bar even lower on the dad jokes by telling the, the interrupting oh cow joke. So... 
which is brilliant because now I can say whatever I want and that's the, the low bar. And so um, I, I need to, maybe I'll give him a Starbucks card for doing that, so. That is very true. <laughs> he had my respect until the dad joke and then he just completely obliterated it. <laughs> I think he felt obligated like on the spot. So, um, but yeah, so. Yeah, he, he teed it up and made you a star again, so. Yeah, you can thank him. A couple Starbucks cards, probably good. All right, any questions out there? Hopefully we've answered Mike's question. Um, Adam, have you heard anything about this $600, you know, dropping from $10,000, uh, you know, SARS report to now all of a sudden IRS is going to be looking at every $600 transaction? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, there is some value around, hey, we're going to have people start reporting, you know, more stuff to the IRS. I mean, you know, they, they've had various machinations of this. I mean, you know, it, it's all targeted towards trying to do some analysis to try to identify underreporting issues. You know, they tried to do the same thing with, you know, sales reporting a while back and, you know, 1099 matching and all that kind of stuff. I, it's one of those things where, you know, in theory, you know, we should be out of business because the IRS in, in conjunction with banks should have everything they need to determine my taxable income on, the, on you know, kind of medium, you know, complexity and down um, tax returns. You know, that implies that they're smart enough to even know what to do with the data if they actually had it. <laughs> um, so I just don't see, I don't see this one, even, even though there's, you know, banter around it and there's, oh my gosh, you know, big brothers dip it in to, you know, come take a look at you. I just really believe that it's not going to go anywhere and get removed. But even if they did have it, it would be years before they figured out what the heck they're going to do with it. Because if you did, you know, if you just play that scenario out, you know, when you get audited, you know, the IRS asks for your bank statements anyway, and basically just tries to look at the sum of the deposits and, hey, does that kind of somewhat reconcile with what you reported as taxable income? And if it doesn't, let's try to figure out why there are differences. I mean, that's all this is really trying to do. And it's like, well, they're already doing that. So what are you going to do with the information? <laughs> yeah, like, it, like, so I just don't see, because it would raise, to, you know, there's lots of legitimate reasons including my child tax credits, <laughs> I didn't get any, but if you did, um, that could have led to, you know, maybe my parents gave me a gift. There's lots of reasons that my bank account balance is going to differ from, um, you know, debt from my reported tax income. So I just don't see a scenario where this is going to go anywhere. I mean, they, they're, they're way better off spending the money on kind of legitimate Underreporting enforcement activities, which is what the eighty billion dollars you want towards beefing up the, you know, beef, beefing up the manpower there is targeted towards. And, and I'll say I will apologize in advance for my next comment of people who I'm about to pop a memory cap off of a bad memory. But if you remember, only a few months ago, the same entity that we're talking about was implementing all kinds of algorithms and, and databases and collection of information and all kinds of other things in order to better facilitate lending and getting money out to the public. And then there was finger pointing at, you know, whose fault is it? The banks. Well, no, it's the borrowers because they didn't put the data in correctly. So, you know, and, and then we also were talking about the efficiencies of the government and just, and, and not to not to belittle them or anything like that, but it's just the reality is that, okay, um, if you go back to when they were discussing when you kind of get a free pass, that they were going to let you get through without having to do paperwork. You know, well, first they started out with all these, all you have to do all this paperwork and, and uh, legitimatize your application and your forgiveness and everything else. And then they backed off of that. And then they started saying, in the other direction, well, if it's 50, if it's 100K, then we're really not going to look. We're going to believe you unless there is a very overt red flag that we just cannot ignore or kind of turn to the other side and, and really not look at it and be like, yeah, it's probably maybe maybe it's messed up, but we're not going to look at it. So for them to, to now say 
uh, you know, it's it's as if they forgot what happened the 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 show the S show that happened previously that they're going to implement this. Okay, yeah, we're going to have you report. And to Adam's point, it's like okay, they may be able to collect the data. They may be able to put together the algorithms and the the automation and in collecting information. Um, and and that's going to be challenged anyway as well. It's like okay, um, you know, are are banks going to be forced to give up access to private bank accounts? And so there's all kinds of issues in dealing legal issues in dealing with just getting access to the information. But let's presume that it's a voluntary basis and people are gladly willing to share their financial information and their bank account information and balances. Um, what are they going to do with it? And then it's okay, um, analyzing the data and then enforcing, right? Who are they going to go after? And are they going to spend the resources and time? So again, to Adam's point is the m money is better spent on federal resources doing other things than doing stuff like that because it's just a yeah. logistical nightmare from the from the very start from the implementation all the way to the enforcement yeah and it's and, probably going to go into a black hole and just sit there and do nothing and jack i appreciate that you um talk so long because i was able to google the latest on this <laughs> and the latest is that biden backed off of it you know first off it's not you know it's not a law it's a proposal and biden backed off of it so the new proposal is that they would that six hundred dollars which it isn't individual transactions it's just that you know the sum of the inflows versus the sum of the outflows <laughs> if that is more than $600, meaning you accumulated $600 net of in versus out, then that was going to be targeted. They raised the bar in the latest proposal to $10,000, and they're excluding W-2 income and um, Social Security income and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's kind of at least a move in the right direction of what theoretically would make sense, because that would leave me with you know, unreported business income, unreported um, investment income and stuff like that. But it's still, again, it's like, how the hell would you even do that? <laughs> you know, like, what if, like, what if, what if, you know, I'm still working for a guy that's in the stone age that issues me a net paper check. <laughs> so I just, I just don't see, I don't, you know, this is just fraught with implementation problems. Like, Good theory, fraud with implementation problems. So basically what you're saying is that my daughter's babysitting money is is okay now because they raised the bar so high and uh, we don't have unless, to unless she unless she unless she's working at like a job. <laughs> Probably not yet. Yeah. The funniest thing I heard about that, and I just had to laugh out loud. Somebody said, Well, everybody just needs to take out $601 and deposit it $601 in the same day, <laughs> every day. Like, <laughs> yeah, I guess that'd probably blow up the computer. I don't know. <laughs> hey, um, Adam, this is kind of not related, but I've also heard a little chatter in the cu last couple of weeks about cryptocurrency. You know, we just finished up the extensions for personal returns on 1015. Cryptocurrencies kind of eking into some of those returns. Anything as people are going into 2022, I mean, it's it's fast approaching us. Anything that um, from that standpoint that you would recommend making sure that their house is in order for looking for 2021 taxes? Yeah, you know, not... Other than, you know, just be advised that, you know, reporting requirements are, you know, coming up, but the, um, you know, so it basically they're very similar to how the IRS asked the big brokerage houses to start reporting basis information, you know, to the extent that they had it on file, which made them put into place procedures to start gathering basis information when you when you open up or transfer an account from someone. You know, same concept is applying to um, the cryptocurrency environment, you know, because it's been kind of wild, wild west in terms of knowing what you buy it for versus what you sell it for. All right, good. 
All right, any questions out there? And nobody, man, the, the, the chat in the, is just so quiet. Other than do go to that chat. I, I posted it so that everybody could get it. If you want to see the dirty 55 or the dirty 50, whatever it is, uh, on zero corporate taxes <laughs> that Adam posted. So uh, grab that, copy it, paste it somewhere so that you can look at it. Um, you know, yeah, no just, question. Go ahead. Yeah, and just highlight on that. The, these people aren't cheating. You know, they're, they're not violating any law. <laughs> Um, it's just that, you know, the level of the, the, you know, the level using the energy companies, cause a lot of them are energy companies that are on there. It's just that, you know, Hey, Duke energy, you need to start moving into renewable energy. That's great. So I get a tax credit for doing that. Plus I get to depreciate the equipment. So they end up with, you know, 50 years of deferred tax liabilities it's just like that's longer than the freaking solar panel freaking lasts i mean it's just like it it's that it's that it's that kind of level of like you know so it's so duke energy's public spokesperson spokesperson would say we have we we, we pay our taxes like we accrue for it. we're eventually gonna have to pay it but it's like when do you pass the reasonableness of a duration <laughs> of time before you're just like 50 years is effectively like not having to pay. <laughs> you know, so it's like they're just, you know, my vote, if I got to vote, would be there ought to be some sort of time limit associated with it. Or, you know, the the uh, minimum tax that they're looking to um, pass would be another way to, to solve for that. So. Well, it's interesting. I'm looking at the list. And so I, I have mixed feelings about it. So um fedex so the, the they called out four of them uh five of them actually so fedex nike dish network and salesforce so fedex i'm okay with it still amazes me that they can get stuff into the person in, into an office the next day so i'm i might personally give them a pass um nike i pay, pay a ton for my nike stuff so i think they need to be paying taxes um dish network i don't have dish but i know i pay a lot of money for my uh my media in this house so they should be paying taxes. Um, Salesforce, yeah, okay. But um, so, you know, I, like I said, I have mixed feelings about some of these, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, you look at their uh, income statements, they're making a ton of money. So maybe, um, I don't know. So, but it is an interesting list. Uh, yeah. Not surprising on some of them, but some of them it's like, okay, really? That's interesting uh, yeah. voodoo, voodoo Salesforce. magic. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I hear you on everybody that's been hitting the chat, to, you know, but to, to Karen, to answer your question, <laughs> you know, it, it's an, it's an interesting theory, but the point is they already have the right to request this information anyway, when you get audited and you pretty much need to comply. Otherwise, you know, the, the finding of the IRS is going to be, well, then you're a complete fraud and, you know, nothing that you claimed obviously existed um, at all. Plus, remember your brokerage statements are already getting reported, you know, when you receive a 1099. So, you know, presumably the bank would just start issuing a 1099 off your personal check and even savings accounts. You know, it, again, I, I go back to, you know, is it a good idea or not? You know, probably not. I mean, I, you know, my own my own opinion, if I, you know, if I'm allowed to share one, is that a much better approach to solve this problem would be to look at my reported income relative to my property tax value. <laughs> you know, if that didn't, if that wasn't in line with some certain ratios, chances are I'm committing fraud somewhere. Would probably be yeah. a better way to look at this, but that's just me. <laughs> Yeah, so for anybody that, because uh, not everybody can see the, the question, and I think the question is pretty funny, and I'll read it verbatim. Query to the libertarian and or attorney, would the proposed cash flow reporting violate constitutional prohibition against unreasonable searches? Very good question. <laughs> that is a very good and creative question. Um, you know, it's okay. So then you get into, well, 
when you sign up for, um, you know, uh, well, cash flow purposes, I'm thinking more like bank accounts and that kind of stuff. It's a private, a private bank, private entity. So as far as unreasonable searches, um, yeah, you might have a hard time with that. That's more geared towards um, finding illicit drugs, guns, that kind of stuff. So, um, but I would not be surprised. You know, and maybe uh, whoever asked this question might ch do a Google search every once in a while, maybe every six months to see if someone has filed a claim for unreasonable searches for if there is an intrusion into this per personal financial data, if that's where we end up going as a society um, down the road. So it, a very thought provoking and interesting question. It is. Yeah. Somebody's paying attention. <laughs> all right well adam you got four minutes before you got to pack up the dogs and the kids and your wife and head to the beach that's right have fun man thanks i appreciate that thank you for allowing uh this to interrupt that packing day and you know heading heading to the beach so uh youngest had an ap us history test too so we need to have him suffer um so <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well there you go that's good <laughs> uh, it's good to have you guys on here anybody that came on here late um we will put this up on the bgw cpa youtube channel later on this afternoon and well, since we no had one's no, answered your question no, no takers yeah yeah i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna do a repeat we're gonna wear it next week <laughs> <laughs> I'll wash it between. All right. See you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you. We'll see you around. Bye-bye.